Nose. I am the Tribal Healing to Wellness Court Specialist at the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. And we are here with a panel of great um, experts in the drug treatment court field. Um, and I welcome everybody. I um, want to let everybody know that we um, kind of calling this a webinar for grant reporting purposes, but I wanted it to be an informal discussion because uh, so I think it's really important for drug court programs and those preparing proposals for both CTAS, Purpose Area 3, um, and 8 and 9, um, and also for the BJA uh, Adult Drug Court and Veterans Court grants to have the opportunity to ask questions um, learn about ways to strengthen your proposals um, from folks that um, are in the field and know what um, uh, the grant administrators are looking for. So um, on the team with me from TLPI, I have Janice Thompson. She'll be helping um, sending out links if needed, answering questions that folks have in the chat box or alerting us to them. Um, and just making sure that all the technical stuff gets sorted out as we go along. I'm also joined by, joined by uh, Dr. Kristen Duvall. She is a co-director of the National Drug Court Resource Center. Uh, Carolyn Hardin, the Chief of Training and Research at the National Association of Drug Court Professionals. And Lauren Van Schilfgaard, the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians Tribal Legal Development Clinic Director at UCLA Law School and uh, a former TLPI colleague of ours. So welcome everybody. Um, so I see a few familiar faces and kind of just to get everybody here um, and you know, hanging about and getting to know each other. Can we go around and uh, introduce ourselves and let us know where you're from? I can, you're seeking from, from this discussion. Um, obviously, while, we're, while we were organized, we, ha we have our own ideas of how we could help folks, but really want to make sure that you get as much out of this discussion as um, uh, you can. So you guys can just unmute yourself and let us know what sort of answers um, or what sort of, yeah, what sort of answers you're seeking um, and ways in which we can help other than the two big ideas that we have here of um, helping you understand the submission process that is new this year, but also uh, ways to strengthen your proposals. I guess I will uh, begin. I do have a question. I know that with wellness courts, it comes with a lot of stakeholders and partner collaborations with prevention treatment programs um, because in the beginning starting phases, you can't obviously implement everything that would be necessary for treatment phases. So my question is, how would we, in the grant submission, do we need to have um, strong letters of commitment maybe from local treatment facilities or um, if we're planning on contracting with uh, or um, having MOUs with local agencies, can we express that in the application or if we do express that, are we gonna be expected to have like a MOU? Um, can that be a drafted MOU or is that gonna to have to be a contracted MOU? Um, that's my concern. I think lots of people have different uh, answers to this question, which is all to say, there's no one right way to do it. So there's no, there's nothing I think that you're going to be dinged for, but I think there is a tier of like persuasive information that you can give. Um, so I think like the top tier, right, is one MOU that has all of the parties on there, including a treatment facility, but 
almost more importantly, a treatment representative that's going to serve on the team and attend all of those weekly hearings that you're going to have that will also be attended by the judge, the prosecutor, the defense counselor, the law enforcement officer, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be my ideal as like reading an application. I think it'd be perfectly fine to include a draft MOU that, you know, upon the great news that we receive this grant and as we continue the planning process from March 2021 through the summer, this is the document that we're going to base our planning processes and that we plan on bringing all of our partners together under this document. But it would be neat to have that accompanied by a series of letters of support or of commitment from the various agencies or departments that you intend on partnering with, maybe coupled by like a tribal resolution that says, we intend on establishing a tribal healing to wellness court. And these are the different tribal departments that we expect to collaborate and participate on the healing to wellness court. All of those would be really good, but there's no one definite um, document that anyone's going to be looking for or like checking that you didn't include. So I think the more you conclude, the better, like more the merrier, but you're not gonna get deemed for not including anything. Thank you, very helpful. Well said, Lauren. Does anybody have any other specific questions or things that they want us to discuss or keep in mind as we um, hear from our panelists? So our folks, I was gonna say like, I do only because we were participating in this in the background. I'm really familiar with the, like, the grant application process from like two years ago when I was super immersed in it. Turns out it's completely different now and there's a whole nother like portal that strangely isn't replacing what you had to do last time. It's just in addition. And so with my like fresh eyes that are two years old, it's bonkers and crazy. And I think we should walk through it. And Dr. Duvall has actually like opened up the like portal uh, that is just grants and like the craziness and so I would love to hear from her her and she gave to me a really helpful sort of walkthrough about what's required of this process and how it interrelates with grants.gov and so I found it super helpful I think it'd be worth spending like five minutes there okay great good afternoon good morning to some of you uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Right. Oh, hey, just to respond to Forrest real quick, the award ceiling is just for that application. So for example, I think like some of them are like $500,000. That's just for your application for the Healing to Wellness Court. And so definitely if you can figure out how to like stick a budget item for each one, apply for the full amount. Mm -hmm. So the total, like for the whole, for all the applicants, for like the BJA drug courts, I don't know, it's, Carolyn, you probably know this off the top of your head. I think it's like 40 million or something. And then for CTAS, the total CTAS for all the purpose areas is like, <gasps> I used to know this off the top of my head. Is it like 120 million? But that's for all nine purpose areas. You are correct, Lauren, on the dollar amount for the uh, adult drug court. Uh, yeah, and that includes the grantees and the TTA providers. That's everything in that dollar amount. So it's yeah. a hefty amount. Yeah, yeah, it is hefty. And so, you know, you they will only award you what you ask for. They have never, ever seen an application and be like, oh, you asked for too little, like take some more. No, you have to advocate for yourself. And so honestly, there is a healthy percentage of applications that ask for the full amount. And if you check all the boxes and are compliant in your grant application, they'll award you the full amount. So if you can justify in your budget where like, here's all the things we're gonna spend it on and it's all gonna go to drug court stuff, apply for the full amount. Okay, sorry, Dr. DeVault. You're fine. 
you're fine. Uh, can you all see the slideshow? I have two screens on, so, okay, great. All right, uh, so this particular slideshow is just designed to give you a walkthrough of the Just Grants system, which probably is new for many of you. Um, really quick, sorry to yeah. interrupt Dr. Deval. I think we're seeing the presenter view. Ah, okay. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so this is just a walkthrough of the Just Grants system. So hopefully this may uh, assuage some, some fears of the system um, that is new for all of us. Um, so just a couple of hints uh, as you're getting started with the process. Uh, so one is just to begin the process early. Uh, as um, Precious mentioned, there are actually two steps to this process now. So one involves the grants.gov system. And then the second phase really is in just, um, is in just grants. So the information that you enter into grants.gov is the same as it's always been. Uh, so you'll, you'll find the application announcement uh, and then enter information into that SF-424, which is that sort of cover page that uh, lists the, the DUNS number, the EIN number, your legal applicant name, uh, as well as the dollar amount that you uh, intend to ask for. Uh, so you may be saying to yourself, this is premature. We haven't even fleshed out our budget. Uh, so the thought is, I, I definitely agree with Warren, uh, put in for uh, the maximum dollar amount because you can change it uh, in just grants. Okay, so this is almost like like an intent to apply, really. Uh, and the information that you enter into the SF-424 will actually populate into just grants. There's a second document in just grants, um, or sorry, grants.gov that you need to complete. It's a lobbying disclosure. So those are the only two pieces of information that you will enter into grants.gov. Once that process has been completed and you hit submit, um, I'm not actually sure how long it takes for the information to populate into just grants. I don't believe it's immediate. Uh, you can't move from one system uh, into the next. Uh, so it may take a day or so in order for that information to be um, sort of pushed into the new system. But once you've hit, you've hit submit, the next step of the process is for um, someone within the um, within your tribe to go into Just Grants uh, and assign users. All right, and so there are essentially three main roles within Just Grants that are important for the application process. The first one is, an, is the authorized um, representative, and this is essentially the individual who has the ability to uh, accept grants on behalf of uh, your tribal organization. So that is one user. The second is an entity administrator. And so this individual, uh, kind of the, the caveat for this particular role is that they can assign roles and manage the different users. The third is the is our application submitters. Um, and so this is somebody that can work on the application um, and ultimately submit these. The interesting piece about this is that the same person can be all three of these, but you can have unique individuals that sort of manage users um, and then an, an authorized representative. So whatever sort of works uh, for your organization, um, you can assign those roles accordingly. But do note that only one individual can be working in the application at one time. Ah. So that is sort of a limitation <laughs> of so the system. Did you, did you play around with that? We did. And I couldn't see the application when it was open in somebody else's Okay, screen. it kicked you out? It didn't kick me out. I just couldn't see it. Just couldn't. That's even I kind couldn't of worse, see that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so the, it might have been, you know, maybe that's an upgrade that they're working on, but that was our experience was you couldn't see all of the things um, that so, was in there, yeah. So for that, like, what's your big tip if folks can't work on it at the same time? Right, so you can't have somebody in the system working on the budget while somebody else is, you know, uploading documents um, into the system. So I would say designate one person to 
work on sort of uploading or have one person sort of be the designee to complete the, the information in the portal would be my. I totally agree with that, but I would also still bother in this step to sign at least one other person, but ideally yeah. like two trusted people and have like a Slack channel or something going on. Like I'm in it now, knowing that like when it comes to submit, you can guarantee like your computer is gonna, you know, mess up or the power is gonna go out or something. And so, you know, distribute the risk and yeah. have yeah. multiple people that can hit the submit button. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so those are the three kind of primary roles that, um, that need to be designated in the system. So somebody to manage the roles, definitely the authorized um, representative, and then you can have um, folks uh, being the application submitter. Uh, and, and Just Grants has a whole host of trainings specifically around the managing um, of those different roles uh, within Just Grants. So uh, there are some additional resources that explain uh, in greater detail kind of what all of those different roles are. Um, but one important piece is once those roles have been assigned, the authorized representative must go into Just Grants and authorize or approve the screen flow for the application. Um, so this is a step before whoever's going to be working in the system um, in order for that individual to see the information. And I'll show you the next slide is a screenshot of what that looks like. Uh, so that you know to be on the lookout for what this is. So this is the um, what you'll see when you open up uh, the screenshot. Hopefully you can see that. Um, but the uh, application sort of uh, call that you're responding to will show up here. So the, the BJA number. Um, the other information I think is it just what populates uh, from there. But you'll see up here, grant application screen flow, complete and submit. And so your um, authorized representative would just need to go here and click begin. Uh, and so there's a couple of questions that that individual uh, will answer and then the information will, uh, will show up. So that's a, a step that just needs to happen early in the process so that then uh, everything opens up within the portal. Um, so that's that. Um, and here are a couple of recommendations. Uh, so one, this system works best with either Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox browsers. So I would encourage you to use one or both of those. They're free downloads, um, but those are the systems that uh, work best with, with the Just Grant system. Also save often, and I'll show you an example of a screenshot in a minute, um, but this system does not automatically save information. Uh, and so as you're entering information in here, I would just get in the practice of hitting save uh, more regularly than, than less frequently. Um, so save often. And then uh, many of the attachments that you're gonna be including. So for example, the project narrative file uh, that you've always prepared. So that has the, the statement of the problem that has the project design and implementation, the capabilities and competencies, and then the um, performance measures information, that document, you still will prepare that as an attachment. Um, and so the system, Just Grants, will allow you to upload those documents as you've done in the past. Uh, and it, you just need to make sure that you save these files as either a PDF document, a Word file, or an Excel document. So it will handle any one of those uh, types of files. Um, and so my recommendation would, would be to prepare those as you've done before, saving them on your, you know, your computer or if you have a Dropbox folder or something, some place to save those um, outside of the Just Grant system and then upload them when you're ready. And that way you won't lose information. Um, so just some lessons learned on that. Um, and then the next phase of, and this is where it really gets into your application materials. So once your authorized representative has uh, approved that workflow, uh, you can start actually working in the, the various uh, sections of the application that you need to complete. 
Uh, and so all of the application materials will be located on the right hand side uh, in a channel. And uh, the first item there will be the standard application information. Uh, and so essentially, this is where you will see all of that SF-424 information that you entered into uh, grants.gov will populate in here. So you can check and make sure that everything is listed accordingly. Um, this is also where you can change that dollar amount that you're requesting. So maybe when you entered in the information into, into grants.gov, you hadn't yet worked on your budget. Uh, and so you have a revised amount you can change it here. And I'll, again, the next slide is a screenshot of that. Uh, you also need to confirm the authorized representative um, and then also verify that legal name uh, that you would have entered uh, in that grants.gov. So this is merely, you're just sort of um, approving what was entered into grants.gov, uh, but then also being able to change that dollar amount that you requested. So this is a screenshot of that. You'll see on that uh, upper right-hand side, um, over here, um, this uh, information that you'll be verifying uh, will appear at the top, and then you'll see the proposal abstract, uh, the proposal narrative, the budget, MOUs, and other supporting information. So this is really the outline, if you will, of your application. And these are all radio buttons, uh, and so they do open up a new screen within the, the Just Grant system. Um, but here is the competition ID number, the name, the due date. So it does um, provide you with a sort of a countdown uh, for when the project is due. But the um, this is the information that I was mentioning earlier about that populates from grants.gov. So the, the project name, uh, the dollar amount. And so again, you can update that here uh, based on what you, what you will want, what you'll be asking for. Um, and then if there's any other information um, non-federal amount uh, as, as well as program income if you have that and need to, to report that. Uh, so all of this information is pre-populated. Just note here, you can change the dollar amount. This is where you do that. Then you'll see down at the right-hand side here, right lower right, uh, a save button and a continue. Uh, and so when we were working in the system, we just hit save every couple of minutes in order to, to save the information that we were entering. Um, and so the continue button, which is right next to that, uh, is where you can advance to sort of the next screen. You can also navigate up here by clicking on any of these radio buttons. So this um, section on the right uh, sort of stays constant as you're moving through the various screens um, there. So again, moral of the story here is just hit save often uh, to be able to save your work. All right. Uh, so moving on to the next stage, this is the abstract. Uh, so this is right below that uh, SF-424 information that's pre-populated. So this really starts uh, the new information that you'll be entering into Just Grants. Um, and so uh, again, you know, there, the specific information that you need to include in that abstract is outlined in the request for proposal uh, that you're responding to. So just be sure to read uh, to include all of those items. Um, we would recommend you save, you create this on your computer as a Word file. You can cut and paste uh, it into this box here. Um, so this is a portal uh, field. Uh, it's editable. It's, you can include um, formatting, you know, bolding if you want to, underlining and that sort of thing. Um, and so you would do all of that here. But we would recommend you save it as a document uh, and then work. Uh, sort of backwards from there. Um, and then again, just make sure you hit save. Uh, so that's uh, the proposal uh, abstract. Then the project narrative. Uh, so you'll see uh, the information, obviously detailed bullet points about what you need to include there. You'll prepare that just as you always have um, as a Word file, save it on your computer because you're gonna upload this document uh, into the portal. Um, and then, What's new in the system is in this same screen where you upload the project narrative, there is also a screen that talks about goals, objectives, and deliverables. Um, so this is new uh, in the Just Grants system. Um, and so this is what that screen looks like. Um, and so hopefully you can read um, the, the narrative there, um, but we put some, just some, sort of helpful hints to think about what this looks like. 
So remember that goals, and there are goals, objectives, and deliverables in each one of the RFPs. So the RFP that you may be responding to, either the CTAS uh, or the um, drug court solicitation, um, at the beginning of that document, they have goals, deliverables, and outcome or um, and objectives. And so make sure you read through those to see that your goals, objectives, and deliverables align with those as well. Um, but just some sort of um, quick reminders. Remember that goals are those broad statements. So kind of ultimately what you want your program to do. Um, so an example might be reduce recidivism among tribal healing to wellness court participants. Maybe that's a goal of your program. Um, an objective, how that's different. And so uh, this particular screen shows you what that looks like when it's open. Um, and so you'll just add a new objective or add a goal. Uh, so objectives are the specific means by which you will measure that goal. So if we want to measure whether or not we've reduced recidivism among tribal healing and wellness court participants, we may say, um, for example, by the end of year one, 65% um, of tribal healing to wellness court participants will remain crime-free. That's the way to measure uh, whether or not that goal has been achieved. Um, it also asks you for the fiscal year. So when is that goal going to be sort of measured? Um, so the fiscal year, and that's a drop down. So remember, um, this is gonna be across um, potentially three years. Uh, so you'll select the fiscal year and then when, are, when that, um, particular objective is going to be measured. Uh, and so for this one, that would be something that would be ongoing uh, across the, the project period. So this, again, th these are new. Um, and so that's something that will be specific to your particular program. What goals do you have? What objectives? Um, and just, again, make sure that that aligns with what's listed in the RFP. I, um, I realized that because it's new, I don't know the answer to this, and I wonder if anyone else does, but do we know how like peer reviewers or other people that are assessing the applications are going to receive this information and how it's going to be like incorporated into the peer review process? Um, I ask, because I'm curious generally, but also like how much effort should we be putting into this? Because I could spend all day crafting like the perfect objective that relates to both my drug court goal as well as like this specific goal. But if it's not going to be looked at or is only tangentially related to the rest of the application I uploaded, I don't know. I'm just okay. thinking from a strategy standpoint, especially because it's like already March. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, I wonder if you have any thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I am not sure if they know yet, uh, but I'm not sure that anybody knows what it's going to look like uh, when it comes out of the system. Uh, I don't. I think this is the first round of grants any at all in this system. Mm -hmm. So it will be interesting to see what people get. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. also curious. You know. Um, in crafting, you know, some of these on the application side, right, the temptation is to be very ambitious because I want my application to be attractive. But if these are going to then be turned around and used as the metrics by which I'm evaluated, um, well, suddenly I want to be very conservative, right, because I actually want to meet my goals and objectives. And we don't have a sense, right, if these are going to become the evaluation tool that we have to submit quarterly reports. We don't know that, right? So kind of right now for the teams who, um, when they get their grants and we do the on-site TA review, so we're looking at what they wrote and oftentimes uh, the performance measures that's in the BJA application will be asking them to meet those specific performance measures. So then when we review what they've submitted in their grant application versus uh, what when we go on site and what they're able to do, we actually may make recommendations for them to make modifications to those goals that they submitted. Mm -hmm. So even if your goals are lofty, you do get an opportunity to revise them uh, once you've been funded, if you are funded. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see that oftentimes where some tribes have put in 
where are we going to go from five uh, people to 25? And it's like, yeah, that's not really going to happen. So how do we actually make that be something that they can meet? Uh, mm -hmm. So they have been very uh, easy with them making those modifications. Well, that's really helpful, right? So it's kind of like permission about like, be ambitious, but it's also, I think, useful to know that these likely are going to crop up again, that these are going to be numbers that we're going to have to be responsible for as an entire wellness court. Um, yeah. So so that's useful, um, ugh, is my response to doing this. What it, what it reminded me of um, was for uh, on the CTAS side of things, there's Purpose Area 2, which is like strategic planning for the tribal justice system. And I always wondered why CTAS, um, why that was an available thing, because it was such a cumbersome process for a whole tribal justice system to sit down together for two years to crank out a strategic plan, but with very little follow-up on how they were actually going to implement a lot of those planning um, components. So that when you were first talking about this um, during during our call, it just like came, just came to mind about if you are a tribe that was able to um, successfully complete your purpose area two um, project or strategic plan. This is something that can easily be put in here because you have all of those goals, objectives, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, written out already, um, and especially if we're planning for a healing to wellness court. So they would have a jump start right there. But we have a question from Terry. Okay. Right ahead, Terry. Unmute. The word of the year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we at Fort Hall are putting in for four of the CTAS grants. Okay. Each one of us has an area that we're handling, but as I go in and look at the same page that you guys have been showing us, I can see that only our entity administrator and authorized representative and application submitter have gone into there. So you know where you can go in and put all those individual objectives and goals and things? Mm -hmm. I know that my um, head of grants thinks that she has to put it in for each individual of the four C tests. So she's like, Dev she's really worried that all of a sudden she's going to have 500 cut and paste spots to put in because she's doing it for four different C task grants all at the same time. Is there a way for her to assign each of us that are um, leading one of the C tasks so that we can put that information in? Because I'm not seeing where I can do that. I can only see that she can. Mm -hmm. And it would be so much less problem for her if, if I could just put in the ones for me. Yes. So she will need to give you that permission within whatever, whatever grant you're working on, whichever application. Um, okay. That will be part of the role. Yes. Okay. But it won't. So I guess my question is um, right now it sees the grant as one huge, the um, one huge item. Well, maybe not. Maybe she just hasn't uploaded the rest. Okay. Never mind. Re ignore my. Ignore my question. I will do more research. Um, but that reminds me that I probably should have her listen to this um, after you guys, after we're all done. So if you could let us know what the recording is, then I can send it to our grant person. Yeah, I will definitely do that, Terry. And we'll be sure to process it as quickly as we can and then send it out shortly after this. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. So the goals, objectives, and then there's another section here that I want to show um, a screenshot just because it, it is a pop-up window. And this is around the deliverable. Um, and so again, hopefully you can see what this looks like um, and what the options are. Uh, and so from what we can tell, this may or may not be applicable uh, to the grants that you're applying for because you'll see that some of these are um, 
you know, an evaluation report as a deliverable. Um, and so maybe part, maybe one of your goals is to evaluate the program. A deliverable would then be the evaluation report. Um, and so you'll designate in there uh, that the evaluation report will be submitted annually um, or something like that. So this may or may not be applicable to what it is that you're doing. Um, again, depending on what you're asking for and, and how you're spending the funds. Um, but this is a, a pop-up um, window that you can select uh, if there's something that you need to include there. Um, some of you, if you're doing some planning work, um, it may be, um, so um, that you are putting together an MOU. Uh, and so an MOU is actually one deliverable. Uh, so maybe it's finalizing that. Uh, you could list that as a deliverable and then have that be something that, um, that you upload uh, once that's completed. Um, so that is goals, objectives, and deliverables, which is a new, a new section um, in that portal. Um, the budget narrative. <laughs> So this might be, for those of you that have worked on budgets before, you used to enter all of the information into an Excel document and then attach. You actually now enter each line item into the Just Grants system. Um, and so this will take some time. Um, the one caveat to that uh, is that you can copy, you can enter sort of year one's budget and then copy to year two and year three. So if you have reoccurring uh, line item uh, items, you can copy that uh, from year to year. The categories are the same uh, as they've always been. Um, and so the system will automatically uh, auto total each of the sections for you. So you don't need to, to worry about that. Um, the, so you have the, the line items where you list the dollar amount for each um, piece. And then also at the bottom, there's a text box where you actually will enter um, the detailed information uh, about, for example, on personnel, what are their roles and responsibilities? What are they gonna be doing for the fringe? How was that calculated? So all of that uh, budget detail information that you've included previously, uh, that is actually entered into a text box um, on that section. Um, and then the indirect cost you can, um, attach the indirect cost letter uh, that you have. Um, and then there's also a place to upload the financial management questionnaire if that's a required document for your particular um, solicitation. Um, so you'll see actually the first screen that shows up um, is asking about conference costs. Uh, so if your budget includes conference costs, they wanna know that um, and then um, you can provide a, a short explanation there. So for this particular um, solicitation, there was a, a requirement that three uh, team members attend a meeting annually over the three year project period um, in DC. So we just listed um, that yes, this budget does include that um, and here's why. So feel free to, to use that language if that's applicable for um, your particular solicitation. You will see on the right-hand side here, what I've boxed are each of the sections of the budget that will, that will open up um, once you've clicked on the budget and associated documents radio button. Uh, so you'll see all of these uh, sections were what you completed in the past. Uh, it's just now, again, you need to enter them um, into the system versus an Excel file and then attaching that. Um, and here's what that system looks like uh, when you open it up. So I just entered some things in here so you could see uh, sort of what that looks like. Uh, the name, the position, the salary, um, if it's annually, uh, time worked, um, and then for the percentage of time for that person. So you'll see it does auto total off to the right. Uh, and then down here, it auto totals the personnel uh, category, if you will. Um, so that information. And then down below is where you would enter all of that um, budget narrative information um, for that. And then again, the save and the continue buttons. So uh, again, just remember to save often. Okay, we have a question from Quiz here. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Do we have to do each of these budgets separately for each purpose area? And Lauren, would you know the answer to that? For CTAS, 
at least in the old days, it was all one budget. And so um, if you remember, they had that, it's the Excel spreadsheet, and then it has the sheets, one sheet for each purpose area, and then a final sheet that had like a snapshot of all the budgets. And so technically you can divvy out like a sheet to each purpose area, which is probably what you would do depending on like who's doing what. But at a certain point, someone has to consolidate all of that, put it all into one um, uh, Excel spreadsheet and upload that spreadsheet for each of the purpose area applications. Um, it's not critical that they like talk to each other and be reflective and stuff. But I mean, I think for the purposes of uploading, just like all of this, you need somebody who's man ultimately can speak for all the CTAS budgets. So can I mention something with that one? Yeah. So I was just looking, so my question before was because the, um, I went over to the Just Grants page and it said that the grant that was listed was BJA 2021-60008. Um, it turns out, as I looked at the um, CTAS grants, that each one has a different number next to it. And so it looks like that each grant package will be separate. So you'll be putting in the separate um, budget, but I know that it, our, our internal requirements are that all budgets have to go to our grantor before we're allowed to upload anything. And so that may be the only thing that you need is to um, make sure, because we don't use the same Excel file. We use an Excel file for our for um, Showband that is completely different than your Excel file. So we always have to transfer everything over afterwards because they're, they, they're completely different. So I, I'm hoping that that was helpful for someone because that that's what, what I'm getting from looking at here is that we're going to put each budget in separately. Okay. Yeah. What I'm getting too is that Just Grants has not really conceived of something like CTAS, right? Mm -hmm. Where CTAS is this whole consolidated collection of different grants. And I honestly don't think it has like the software conception that these different applications need to talk to each other, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right, Terry. I think you're going to have to divvy it up. And so honestly, I think you have to prepare for both, right? Which like under Shoshone Bannock protocols, you've got to collect everything isolated, consolidate it. Then you're going to have to someone, you know, re-separate it out into all of these things. But remember that Just Grants is just one portion of the like upload process, you also have to upload it again, like in the old way where it's this consolidated file again. Um, so, so I think you have to do both. Why? I don't know, right? We know on the um, it peer review side, they're going to break up all those purpose areas. And so your peer reviewer is going to be just reviewing your purpose area nine and looking at just your purpose area nine budget, even though they'll have access to all of the other purpose area budgets, they won't really be looking at it in their review process. Um, in theory, someone at DOJ is looking at the whole comprehensive budget, but, but I'm just speculating. Mm -hmm. Also, just just so that people know, I've been reporting on our old grants, um, our ones that are in already, and they did use a different numbering system for whether it's an award or whether it's an application. So try to make sure that you jot down every number it throws at you because you get to the um, all awards where you need to write your report and they're under a, an award ID that starts FAW that has nothing to do with any of the grant numbers that we've had. So it's kind of confusing. So make sure you write down everything multiple times so that you have it cross-referenced. Thank you, Terry. That's helpful. Great. Um, 
so here are just a couple of the other sections of information that you'll need to um, just be mindful of and if it's appropriate and applicable to your particular solicitation, um, adding um, adding in there the, the documents. And so um, most of these require just a, a Word, PDF, or Excel file upload, um, but there is one here, the disclosures and the assurances where you'll just, you'll respond to questions that appear online. Uh, so there's an MOU section, um, there's an additional application component section. And so again, if there are other uh, pieces of information that are related to your application, you'll enter those there. Um, the disclosures and assurances, um, you'll just answer the questions online there. Uh, and then there's an other section. Um, and so this, is, this can be um, where you upload documents uh, that don't have any place uh, elsewhere in the electronic portal. Uh, so things like the time task plan that may be required for some applications, um, you could upload it there. If you have a references page um, from your project narrative file, you can upload that um, to that section. Uh, and so again, this is what it looks like uh, on that screen. So you'll see um, this boxed area here is where those radio buttons are located just right under that budget. Um, and so um, and then the final step, once you've uploaded all of that information, you've answered the pieces online, uh, then there's that certify and submit button that um, is similar to in years past, um, where it will uh, check the, the application and then uh, submit on your behalf. Um, so hopefully that's helpful um, in terms of uh, walking through uh, the Just Grants system. Um, but if you have additional questions, um, you're welcome to uh, let me know by email or obviously I'll stay on, on the on the Q&A for today. Um, but if you have questions moving forward, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask. We're happy, happy to help. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Duvall. Um, that was really helpful and um, I know, uh, Lauren, if you can remember, we got an email from um, somebody who has, had a question about required documents. Um, didn't know if anybody else had this question. Uh, can't remember right now. About, sorry, that was not very helpful. Was this in regards to that like SF form? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I forget, but I think that's just like a form that everyone has to fill out as far as like where you would test that you're not participating, you're not lobbying, um, with this money and stuff like that. I think it's a real straightforward form. It's usually, um, provided as like that, like main uploader. And it's really like, I attest, like, we're not going to use this money to commit felonies and stuff like that. And so I think it's very basic and it's just the part of the standard protocols, sort of if you know if you fall into those categories because you're doing sort of things that are be way beyond the scope of the application. Um, and then the only other thing that comes to mind with required forms is that some of them require an upload of the tribal, um, of a tribal resolution authorizing that you are in fact like authorized by the tribe to apply in their name. Um, which I've always had um, issues with because other non-tribal governments are not asked to make such a uh, attestation that they are reflective of the government, but that's a thing. And so honestly, I think for those of you that are including a tribal resolution, like showing the parties that are committed members to that, to me, that's satisfactory for, for that requirement. But just wanted to flag that as like, the like required jargon that you have to upload. Another one is an indirect, indirect cost agreement that if you have a negotiated indirect um, agreement with the federal government um, to upload that, it's usually to your advantage to upload that because it's usually a much higher rate than what the default rate is. So if you have a negotiated one, include that because then you get to designate a bigger portion of the pie to like the other fund, which is really great. Um, for those of you that don't have a negotiated indirect agreement, don't worry about it. You're just stuck with the default, which I forget. It's like 
15% or some random percentage. 10, 10%, Carolyn knows. <laughs> Jessica always did all like the numbers for me at TLPI. So I was like, I don't know, it's a number. Great, thank you for that. Um, so let's kind of switch gears here. Um, also feel free to ask questions as they come up about just grants and grant submission stuff, but thinking extra proposals, um, Carol and I had a conversation last week about what th things other than the basic operations um, should you include in your proposal? Um, and this goes not only for newer programs, but also existing programs. Um, when we're thinking right, this is a year that none of us could have ever expected to have happened. And we've seen the effects it's had on our uh, programs, both operationally and um, with our clients. So in keeping that in mind, it's always best to keep that planning, um, that forward thinking going forward. Um, so um, Carolyn, we were talking about what ways can uh, programs look to strengthen their proposals when looking towards the future for planning for unexpected things um, that they may not have thought about a year ago, but wish they did. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, uh, Precious, for that great setup. So one thing that I always recommend to folks when you are writing a proposal is to think about it from this perspective. I want to build infrastructure for my community. So what does that mean? Whatever you purchase, you want to build into this application, things that you can do that even when this money is all gone, you still have the ability to make these things happen. So there are a couple of things that I am encouraging teams to think about. Uh, and one of those is this. So when they shut down and everybody had to go home, was that easy? And if it wasn't, what were some of the hindrances for making it easy? Number one things that we heard around the country was, well, a lot of our folks did not have laptops. So they couldn't easily make that transition to work from home because everybody didn't have a laptop. That may be something you want to think about in these proposals that you are writing. Do we need to get laptops for staff? Do we even need to think about for, in some of our jurisdictions, broadband was fun, right? Uh, and then you just threw on the pandemic. I live out in the country uh, in a new community where there used to be nothing but deer and where everybody roamed. So the first week when they turned everybody home, I had zero access. I was like, it knocked up. I was like, what's happening? Well, now, cause everybody is in this community on this little, this brand new broadband they just put out here that really wasn't accommodating for all the folks who are now at home doing multiple things. Uh, I ended up getting another, uh, um, what do you call that thing upstairs? Because I wasn't getting, and it didn't matter. It still just was like noon, forget it. Might as well go outside and sit on the porch because you weren't going to do anything. So you want to think about, well, what technology do we need? Because I was able to get on with my portable broadband that I carry when I travel, as opposed to the one that I had in the house. Do we need to look at getting uh, portable ones for staff to have for people to use. Because we are a travel agency, we have that because our staff can't get onto our uh, shared drive without being on a secure internet. That's something to think about. The other issue was we had some jurisdictions who could not get in contact with their participants because first off, they didn't have access to that database or their files because they were on some other server that they didn't have access to on their phones or they didn't have access to it on their work laptops. So do we need to come up with a way? Technology is something you wanna be thinking about. What technology do we need to add into this project that we have never added in before that we now need? 
For example, there's this thing called VOIP. Uh, these are your voice operated telephones. Who knew? I didn't realize that NADCP had one until I was at home and my phone was ringing on the computer. I was like, what is that? They was like, it's your office line. I was like, oh, so it's following me? They were like, yeah, wherever you go, it rings through your laptop to you. So I couldn't miss a phone call. And the other thing is I could ring back to people from that number at my house without giving out my home phone number or my cell number uh, if I didn't want to, because I could use that. You got to think about those types of things, because as much as we all believe that we're coming out back to normal, I don't think our normal is going to be what we thought our normal, what our normal used to be. So these are things you want to uh, give consideration to. Other things that I want you to think about that are big picture. Uh, we see a number of treatment courts and especially uh, tribal courts when they get ready to start a healing to wellness court, we're saying to them, hey, you need a risk assessment. Some of them are like, yeah, what's that? Well, once you find out what it is, you need to think about how are we going to assess our clients to actually make sure that they meet, we get the risk and need that they have. So you might want to get a tool or put in money to purchase a tool. And things you want to think about, there are some programs who have the older models of those tools that are doing by paper. Well, you might want to write in to upgrade to get the electronic version and then to write money in for every other year or each year for training, because unfortunately we see high turnover, then I need to train the next people who are coming in. So I might build those things in. Uh, I would even look at my treatment agencies that I'm going to be working with as well as to ask them what tools are they using? How long have they had those tools? Is everybody trained in it? Because again, you might want to write in for ongoing training for them or to update those tools that are needed. And I want you to think about your community, your tribe, and think about it from this perspective. What can we get? that no matter who leaves or this money leaves, we still have it in our community that we're able to access it. So I will be looking at that. Other things to think about is that a number of folks had issues with their participants. Some uh, participants only had, you know, minute phones. I bought 25 minutes, that's all I got. I can't call into court, I can't check in. And those were things. There is a lot of new technology where there were courts who were buying phones for their participants uh, that had Wi-Fi already in them, that had uh, already set up for um, confidentiality for treatment and different things. So you want to Google and see some of those uh, different technologies. If you go to the NDCI uh, org or NDCRC, where the COVID nineteen resources we created a thing called innovations. And on that innovations are things that courts said, we got these phones during the pandemic and they saved uh, us of having to go out and do visits. We were able to track our clients. We were able to get in touch with them. So there's a number of those. Uh, one of the uh, tribes in upstate New York, one of the things they did was had their participants download, uh, and I can't think of the name of the app, the SmartLink app on their phone and so they were then still able to con con connect with them and be in touch with them. Well, some courts even bought iPads so that people could have them uh, to be able to continue treatment, continue to do some of those things. So look at your community and find out what you might need and build in some of the cost of those and talk about in your application when you write your justification, we learned from COVID-19 <laughs> that we needed these things uh, to survive. Drug testing becomes another issue. A number of programs were like, we're out. We can't drug test. We ain't getting in touch with nobody. I ain't touching you. Okay, then do you need to have PPEs for event this happens again? But also when people are drug testing, I don't want to be that close to that. So I might need these new tools. Do we need to look at adding more than just urine to our drug testing protocols. So a number of courts started buying more uh, patches, less time for people to come in, you know, longer times. The other thing was, what about 
uh, oral swabs. And one of the great parts was that people could take their phones and they could put the little thing on the stick and they could blow and it would show them blowing and you could see them blowing. The other thing was with the oral swabs, they could get on with their probation officer, do the oral swab and they watch them via their telephone to watch them uh, put it and seal it to make sure that it was forensic and capable of being tested the right way and stick it in the mail. But those things were some additional costs that courts went in and looked at of doing. So those are things that I recommend you to look at. And even think about when you come back, right? Some of us are slowly coming back. How do the offices need to change? I have not been to the grocery store and the other day when I went to um, my doctor and you know where you, they go, they send you in the back to pay. There used to be this nice little space between me and the lady. There ain't no space anymore. There's a big set of slab of plastic, a little divider, you slide under there and then you send it back. Uh, everywhere you go today, there are sanitizer stations. Are y'all gonna have those in Europe? Do you need to think about, even after this, of having uh, gloves for your staff when people are coming in, doing different things, not just for drug testing, but things to think about. I'm also gonna encourage you all to think about being trauma-informed offices. So do we need to build in uh, for some different things uh, that the grants would cover. For example, there is a number of us who see clients who come in who bring their children. Is there a space for the kids? You know, <laughs> do you want to just craft out? And what I love to tell people about a project we did at NADCP through our Advancing Justice with Sesame Street. Sesame Street has all this free stuff you can just download from the internet and put in there, there's games, there's uh, videos for the kids to watch and do different things. Is that something that you can put in? We want to use funds to create a space, uh, the purchase training materials, different things that you can put on the wall to make it a family friendly space. Cause oftentimes a lot of them come with their kids. Uh, just things that you can uh, think about. Uh, other thing that I want to remind you of, especially if you're applying for the Adult Drug Court Discretionary and Veteran Treatment Court Grant, oftentimes I see people forget this. So here's a couple things that that grant does cover. Did you know that you can include funds for child care for kids younger than 14? So we have a lot of participants who are in our program who don't have anywhere to take their kids, I don't know what we're going to do, but as long as those clients are in participating in treatment court activities, going to group, going to treatment uh, treatments, going to recovery support, and they need assistance with child care, you can write in for funds to cover those costs. There's also money for drug-free and transitional housing assistance. So you can provide funding and write in there for short-term 12 clean uh, and sober housing assistance, including rental or utilities payments assistance, assistance with transitional housing. Uh, these are things you can look at. For like a couple of years ago, uh, the uh, Hanu, I know I might be saying that wrong, but in Alaska, that tribe actually rented a building, uh, paid for rental, room rental for participants who were in their treatment court. Uh, for them have six to 12 months of housing uh, while they were going through treatment, once they got through treatment to get out, get a job, and then were able to get into housing. And, and uh, they have a, don't have a lot of housing in Alaska in this time. So it would take a while before they could find other housing to assist, but they actually found the building, which they were able to do some renovations with, you know, got donations, but Clients were able to get six to 12 months of housing with their assistance, and that's what they actually wrote their grant uh, to cover. Uh, just, to, just to underscore, highlight, bold that, uh, yes, there's so many amazing things you can do. Uh, but another, you made me think another tribe in New Mexico did the same thing. All they did was like apply for money to like literally pay people's rent 
like so they were it was just like rental payments so it wasn't anything fancy um but they ended up developing like a whole portion of this rental complex which happened to be right next door to the tribal police department so it was like if you're really in need of housing here you go but it was it was super simple like there was no infrastructure that they needed to build no like construction it was just like here's an apartment building and we're just paying their rent on their behalf it was cool the other one that I don't see people apply for, but I want to mention today is don't forget their civil legal assistance. How many of our clients that come in have such legal issues uh, in the uh, civil system? So it helps aid people with basic necessities such as health care, housing, government benefits, employment, and educational services. So it's things you can think about with that and even education funds that you can write in to help them with getting their GED or to even pay for GED tutorial programs or even going to vocational programming. So those are things uh, that I thought about that I never see a lot of people ask for uh, that I just wanted to remind. Uh, one other, I got two other things and then I promise to shut up. Uh, one is, Think about this, if your probation department or your case managers, have they been trained in some of this new evidence-based uh, things like EPICS? And there's all these programs about teaching officers and case managers how to use cognitive behavior techniques and direct service work. So it's really how they hold a meeting, what they talk to people about. There's so much new stuff out there that a lot of courts haven't tapped into that, that you can uh, purchase to have that training and those resources. And then you have somebody trained to train next people coming in so that you always have it. Even when the grant ends, you still have those things in there. I like white bison uh, recovery materials. They are great to use, but hey, have you thought about purchasing some that you haven't used before? Uh, that this may be a great opportunity to purchase some of those tools. I know a number of courts are using things like from change companies. Uh, there's a new one called R1, which is all about using cards uh, to help clients learn uh, different skills and tools. And they actually do training for entities on how to incorporate these different things. Uh, and then another one I like is carry guides because there's a guide for everything. Uh, but these are things that you can buy. Many of them come electronic version. Whatever you do, don't buy the, the paper books because once you've given it out or you've copied it a thousand times, it doesn't look that great. But if you buy the electronic versions, you usually get updates from them on those electronic versions. Carolyn, now, sorry, um, can you say the names of those um, materials again? So one is called R1, R1 Learning, uh, Change Companies, and then Carry, C A R E Y Guides. and the white bison recovery workbooks. Okay. I think that was um, something to highlight that you just said is look at the electronic versions. Um, the paper copies, like you said, will go like once you give them away, they're no longer there. They're gonna look ratty. Um, so look at the electronic versions for yes. sure. Yeah, I've been working with a lot of teams who were using for risk assessment, the LSIR, right? And they are not, my understanding from them is they're probably not going to be updating that one because they moved to the LSCMI. So that's something that a lot of people still have the, the paper version for that at some point you might not be able to get those. So that's, a, that's something you just want to think about uh, and talking with those agencies that people are working with. And the other thing too is that even though you have your treatment providers or your staff are like trained in MRT, when was the last time they had a booster session and some of those things? So those are things to write in because you want ongoing training. Uh, there's a, we have a lot of studies that show that 
once we know how to do something, it's routine. So it's almost like driving to work. We know how to get there. Some days on the weekend, your car would go to the office, even though you know you mentally don't want to. It's just automatic. When it sees that road, it goes there. What happens too is then you'll drift back to old behaviors. And if we don't get booster sessions or ongoing training, even in things that we say we've got evidence-based training on, but we haven't been trained in it in years, people will drift back to old behaviors. And so sometimes you wanna write in booster sessions to get people updated on what is new. All right, so I promised I'd stop talking. Are there any questions? <laughs> And just to turn your attention, everybody, to the chat box, uh, Janice has put in links to all of the um, companies and resources that Carolyn has mentioned, and also a little bit further up, um, the web page to the innovations um, that Carolyn was talking about, and Dr. Duvall uh, also included a link to uh, the Just Grant specific trainings that are available there. Um, so there's a lot of great links and resources in the chat box. Um, so I have a question, Carolyn. One, one issue that I've heard um, folks talk about all the time and then a, a, an effect of the pandemic is low referral rates. So either they um, had just gotten their program off the ground. Um, what can they do? What, what uh, can they put into their proposals to bring those referrals back up? Or if they're planning it, um, a, a planning one and knowing that these distance things may um, hinder their referral rates, what, what can they do? So one thing I encourage people to do is to revise your um, your protocols, right? So you got to change your protocols because for a while you might still be in this virtual environment. And so, what's the win uh, at the at the jail or wherever people are for us to be able to be able to have access to people before they get released? or to find places where we can connect with people to be able to get uh, a, uh, an assessment, you know, to do a referral. Other things that I highly encourage is to revise your uh, brochures to make them be about what's in, it, what's in it for me. A lot of brochures are just about, this is what you gotta do, but why would a client wanna do it? So you might even want to think about putting in some funding to actually uh, print your brochures and have them uh, look real nice and professional and to have a different tone on them uh, that have a benefit to the client. When we were doing our equity and inclusion training, uh, one of the things that came out from the studies that were done was that people only told clients the rules never what the benefits are. So all they heard was you can't do this, you can't do that. But nobody ever told them, you know, we actually uh, have housing assistance. We actually have a person that will work with you to do connection, to get you vocational training. Nobody said any of those things. So people were like, yeah, I can sit in jail and do this all day, but oh, this program has that. So a lot of things that we have as requirements are actually benefits to people. It's just that we're not good salesmen. We're good drug, we're good criminal justice practitioners. We know how to tell you what to do, <laughs> but we have to really learn how to tell you why it's beneficial, what the benefits are. That's that's extremely helpful because I feel like the those marketing materials often get left um, to the very end and you're basically, you don't know where you're gonna get those funds to create those materials. And it's really important, right? It helps its sustainability, it helps you create that community buy-in so that folks aren't turned away or just uh, turned off by a drug treatment program, but they know what's happening, but also it's a great way to um, let other agencies know about um, what your program's about and, see, and maybe they'll reach out and seeing how they can help out or when you're going over there to ask if they would like to partner, you have materials at the ready to help inform them of how y'all can um, partner. So that's, I, I think that's a really great tip there, Carolyn. Thank you. And 
just another thing too, if you find out what is the holdup, like for one court found out that one of their biggest issues was, yeah, people were at the jail, but the jails, um, the jail didn't have a camera. They didn't have anything for folks to be able to get on and talk with them. So I was like, they had a BJ grant. I was like, you do realize that you can take some of your funds and use that money to offer them cameras to use in a court and have a room where people can come in and have that one-on-one -on -one individual with you via Zoom or via something else. And they were like, what? I was like, yeah. So that's a whole different relationship when I walk into the sheriff and say, hey, guess what I got? <laughs> How about this? And we need that. And one court, you know, working with another one, they were like, well, include us in to get two or three of these laptops with cameras and we will give you a space where clients can just come in and to do that. And they were like, sure, we, we can do that. Uh, even to update what was in the jail's um, room where they had school, so to speak, or whatever, but to actually put three court uh, computers in there with cameras so folks could do Zoom uh, interviews, they could do all those things with them while they were in the jail uh, for those other ancillary programs. So the jail was like, oh yeah, can we use these when not in session? They were like, absolutely. Just when we have people, can we have them in there? And they were like, absolutely. So now you just made a friend. <laughs> That's a really great tip, Carolyn. Thank you so much. Um, we have like about eight, seven minutes left. I um, just want to reserve some time for the participants on here to ask questions um, on things you've heard or things as you're diving into the submission and looking um, at, the at the different portals. Or, yeah. And um, when we send out the recording for this, I'll be sure to include contact information for myself, TLPI, um, Dr. Duvall, uh, Carolyn and Lauren, Casey, I have any questions at all as the weeks go by and the uh, deadlines loom nearer and nearer. And my email, I'll just put that in the chat box in case anybody just wants to send me any questions. Thank you. Any any questions at all, anybody? All right. Well, I appreciate everybody for taking time to be on this. Um, Lauren had to jump off, um, but Dr. Duvall and Carolyn, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, and it's always great to have you. Um, yeah, appreciate it. And to all the participants, I hope you learned something. I hope you also have an introduction to our wonderful panelists. So I know it's going to get hectic in the next couple of weeks, um, but please feel free to reach out to, to any of any one of us. It's our job to help people. Um, it's, what, what's we're, it's what we're here for. So yeah, do not feel afraid to reach out. Any, any parting words? And if you need training, that's what we also do. So if your teams need training and TA, we're here for that as well. So reach out. Do not sit in your offices and go, oh my goodness, this is, this is terrible. I don't know how we're going to do it. I promise you, you're not the only court that has been at that crossroads. Uh, and everyone has made some, some ways to make it pass. And we work for you and we want to serve you. So please feel free to reach out. And thank you guys for allowing me to participate. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.